Well, listening to everybody else's artist talk was pretty impressive. I, I really enjoyed what my colleagues were saying and kind of intimidating to go, you know, forward because everybody was so articulate. So, um, I'm Susan Underwood, and uh, the last time I think I did an artist talk, uh, I went to art school for one year back when I was in my 20s, and we had to write an artist talk. We had to hand it in. The instructor read my note anonymously, and the person sitting next to me leaned over and said, Have you ever heard such pretentious bullshit? No. <laughs> always, you know, have in history used themselves as their own models. I would never, ever do that. <laughs> I don't like getting my photograph taken. Um, if I took a selfie, it would only be because uh, I needed an alibi for some future crime or something like that. I don't do that. So, um, I was very enthusiastic when, when Agnes suggested this about 13 months ago. I thought, great idea, great idea. I was like, oh yeah, let's do that. And then I got home and I thought, oh my god, you know, I have to look at myself in the mirror and I draw myself. And that was quite intimidating. Um, but then I realized I was kind of taking it too literally, that I'm doing a self-portrait, which there would have to be some aspect of the physical in there. But I've done a lot of work on, on self and you know, when I was doing research at uh, University of Victoria when I was doing my and they, I was reading all these post-modern theorists and talking about the construction of self. And so I thought, okay, well that's that's self too. It's like, you know, who you are in the world is your way of being. It's not just like staring at yourself in the mirror and drawing. It's like who you are. So I thought, well, I'll start with that. I, I was thinking a lot about aging too, which is actually also why I volunteered to do an artist talk because I was reading this little thing about aging well and it said, do something out of your comfort zone. <laughs> so, okay, that's better than you know, jumping on a plane or something. <laughs> um, I, I did think about things about aging, and I was interested in like in Ellen's piece here because you know I was a teacher for uh, all of my professional life, and when you're teaching, you know, with your parent, you get the, the little school photos. Well, you get those taken of you as a teacher too. So I have a little picture of myself up right here as a teacher, and I thought I could do a flip book. You know, <laughs> watch me age. <laughs> then I thought, well, that's kind of um, depressing, so I didn't do that. And, uh, well, I started just doing um, a portrait of myself as a young woman, and I was going to call it that, like portrait of the artist as a young woman. And then I didn't. Um, I just I did this first. It was months and months and months ago, and I left it untitled. I only gave it a title last week. And uh, the title is um, Looking Back on Today. And that is something that comes from when I was doing all of that reading of postmodernism and the self and writing my thesis. I said that one day, I said, I have to look back on today to see how I will be. And then I stopped and I thought, wow, that's, I love that sentence. It's, it's got all this stuff about time in it and how time is not linear. You know, time, particularly you're talking about the self, is all of those things. It's uh, who you were is still here, and who I will be is here, and the present is now. I go, wow. <laughs> so I called it Looking Back on Today, and I, and I was thinking when I did it, there's, um, that's me looking out this way. I'm, I'm on a path, and everybody, there's people there. They're all headed the other way. And I didn't mean exactly that I was swimming upstream or anything, but just that there's that importance of the self, of um, recognizing your context in, in seeing who you become. So that was a part, you know, time in your life where you're, you're looking at the world and you're, you've got a context, you've got society, you've got community, and there you are making your choices and trying to be aware, trying to be conscious of how those things are influencing you and shaping you. So that's still there, I hope. You know, that awareness of 
who am I with, what's my context, uh, where will I be, what will I become. And over here is another piece I did, a little tiny piece. It's called Woman of Letters. And that's just a reference to the fact that I was an English teacher. Um, I read a lot. I study. And there's, you know, words are in my head. Sometimes I've been told by people that I don't speak linear, lin in a linear way, that I kind of go around the circle and get to a point. And I think that may be true. <laughs> Are you laughing because <laughs> this one here, the real one, is 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 kind of got that behind it because I think um, most of my life I've you know kind of been aware of being um, not really different. I was going to call this one. It's called weirdo. After I framed it, I thought, no, I, I wish I'd called it slightly askew. <laughs> that's how I kind of feel. Um, and I was thinking when I did this too, I was thinking of Warhol and you know the 15 minutes of fame, and I thought, okay, he did celebrities. This is here I am. I'm up here. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Three minutes of fame or whatever. But um, I was also. It reminded me um, back. When I was teaching, I hired by the Ministry of Education, along with seven other people, to do um, it was like a revision of curriculum for the province. And I was told at the time that they hired me because I could think out of the box. And then we went to an orientation session the first week I was there, and on the screen in this big auditorium was this big diagram of the hierarchy in the ministry. And there were all these little boxes. <laughs> and person after person was getting up and saying, okay, this is where I am, and uh, this is what I do. And I thought, okay, I'm not sure this is going to be a real fit. <laughs> so I was thinking out of the box, supposedly. And it was kind of brought home to me one day when uh, I was in a meeting and I spoke, I thought, quite eloquently and articulately, about whatever it was we were discussing. And the guy was like two boxes above me stopped and looked at me and said, Susan, we're a room full of intelligent people here and not one of us understood a word you said. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So that is where that slightly askew comes in. You may be, you know, in the mainstream. You might be right in the middle of the mainstream. And I was a school administrator, um, living a very normal life, but you know, it is normal to me get to know them, right? Um, <laughs> And there's always just that little tension of, uh, of um, being your own person. And that tension, I think, is really good. That tension is what makes you yourself. So that's my work. Thank you very much. I'm going to people to know that this that uh, Brown Zero Equipment, which is a report, they have some members in the north. So I'm going to call up Mary Parslow to come. Mary Longshaw to come and We do have the two Marys from the north. <laughs> And Mary Montichon. So I'm going to call on Mary Montichon to come and do her. <laughs> 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 a moment in time, like just how I was at this particular time, all my you know, foibles. And, um, I wanted to acknowledge my past, but I wanted to consider that I would have a future, like this wasn't just it. I've done my portrait and now my life is over. So, um, And I've been wanting to attempt to back print 
since I saw a front print last summer. And so when I saw that the little email come for me, myself, and I, I thought, OK, I'm going to try it. I think I need my glasses. <laughs> um, I wanted to do a back print also, because if you print your back, you're facing forward the same as all of us viewers are facing. So we're looking ahead. And I like that aspect of it. So in order to do the print, I would need paper. And I discovered it's very difficult to acquire good print paper on a big enough roll in the north. And after numerous long distance calls with negative responses, I acquired paper of unknown quality and um, and properties from a local digital printer. Next, I would need a background. A grid in the color I love would be perfect. Not wanting to draw a grid with a pencil and a ruler on such a large piece of paper, I decided to roll house paint over half-inch hardware cloth, which is actually a metal grid, and move the stencil over the paper section by section with the paper on the floor. Luckily, it's fairly straight. It's not too bad. Okay, good. That's the next part done. My intent was to make the full body print like a blackboard so I could write significant words on it with chalk. I practiced how I would get down on the, onto the paper, roll out, put pressure on my arms and legs, and devise how I might handle such a large piece of paper without getting paint everywhere. And I first tried a, your back, but you hardly get anything if you do your back, right? Because you get your butt and maybe the back of your head here. <laughs> so I knew I'd have to do it on the floor. So I thought if we rolled up each end and I sat down in the middle, then I could lift up my legs and roll that out. <laughs> and then roll up this part and lay, lay down. <laughs> so it was all good. I told my husband my plan and he just rolled his eyes. <laughs> so I had to enlist other help. <laughs> with, the, with the help of a friend, um, and I didn't want to scare her, so I wore an apron over my front. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you. Um, so I wore the apron and she rolled me up with the chalkboard paint. And I quickly sat on the paper. I got stuck. <laughs> it kind of went, <laughs> and there I was with my butt on the paper. <laughs> I could hardly move. Um, yeah, the paper and the paint loved one another, and of course I didn't know the qualities of the paint, and I didn't know the qualities of the paper, so sort of random. Um, anyways, all my practicing for rolling out just so was a waste, because my body wouldn't roll as planned. We had to proceed because I was on the paper. <laughs> but the results seemed dubious. It was so dry feeling, so she pressed on my arms and my legs, but we couldn't really make full contact with the paper because I, like, I couldn't move. I was getting very tight feeling by now, so I followed our removal procedure by rolling off. So we sort of planned that I would put my arms on the ground, and she'd roll it up, and I would kneel and I'd be off. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of the paper came off with me. And that's how we get the white earrings. <laughs> yeah, it felt as though the print would surely be ruined. And did you know that chalkboard paint has sand in it? <laughs> so I had to get that off. Yeah. Interestingly, the printed image, though not what I expected, was okay, and I decided I could be happy with the result. And like everyone who said earlier that they put their piece away for a little while, you know, I had the dilemma of how to proceed with the print now because my original intent was thwarted, and I felt I needed something more than just the grid in my body. So I hung it on my studio wall. I considered I might write words on the side, or I might incorporate some kind of stenciled image, or I might paint an edge. I wasn't sure, so I just let it hang. 
I moved on to other work. As a conceptual artist, my work is about the human impact on the landscape of the Peace River region where I live. Two symbols I often use are grids and colored circles. The grid for the land, which is surveyed into one mile square sections, and the circles to represent things that happen to the land. Some time ago, I created a 10 color code for the 36 section numbers that create an interesting pattern when repeated. And the land is actually goes from like 1 to 6 to 12 to 18, like that, up to 36, and then it goes over and over and over. The whole prairies are surveyed like that. I, and I love drawing those circles and coloring them in. Like it's just, I, it's just something I really love to do. So I thought, I came to the realization that I had the grid I needed to create that pattern on my print. It took many hours at my kitchen island, but I actually feel I made a personal tapestry. Just as the humans on the landscape and the other pieces that I work with change the landscape, I'm changed by the numerous experiences I've had. And I'm happy I've put myself into my art in a new way. So that's that's my past, and I've left the ends and the edges unfinished because I'm having a future. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming, and you know, if anybody wants to talk, I, I like to talk. <laughs>
and he's just got me in his grasp, you know. So I made these plates with string gel, and they're drawn, and you can draw with a string gel, and you let it dry on the plate. And then the dark areas are carborundum, which is you put glue on where you want a dark area, and then you shape this kind of um, pretty stuff on, carborundum, and then you get a dark layer. So it's very much a doing process. I don't think too much before I start. I mean, I'm always drawing and doodling and doing stuff. But when I set, set down with the plate in front of me, I just start. And it's very much getting my hands in there. I like dynamic design. I like things that wrap. I like sweeping colors. You know the land, you know? It's all sweeping colors. The trees are sweeping colors. It's beautiful. And I like graphic silhouettes. I was on with the spit the other day in Souk and I took just the trees against the backdrop of the sky. I love dramatic silhouettes. Well, you'll notice that in my pieces. Um, so birds and trees and wind, the effect of wind and family and friends all get put on my work. So what part is the most fun? I think starting something is the most fun. When I heard about this, I thought, oh, yes. My kids are always sending me selfies of themselves. And even the grandchildren sent me selfies. This is me, Grandma, me, you know, <clears throat> which is fun. I mean, it's lovely. But um, I thought, well, this is exciting. I think I'll take part in this. So that's the exciting thing. The thought of the new project just grabs me. Um, what's more challenging? Well, Mary knows this, deciding what to leave out. <coughs> I have to put everything in there. You know, it's full. I mean, you look at my work and it's just full. So deciding what to leave out. And what, what do I find fun and, and, and in the middle of all this is working with my hands, doing the lino cuts, getting in there with my hands, with the stuff, just getting hold of it and getting going. Because once I get going, it tells me what to do. I don't have to think about it. I just do what it tells me. So that's what I like. What are some common elements when you feel successful in your work? Well, you know, when you finish the print, that the best thing I've done. The best thing is the reveal. It's called the reveal. And everybody, we work in a little room up there, and everybody's there on the press. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's lovely. Um, so when you feel successful, did I get the wind or the water? Did I get the curve, that curve or the tree or the land? <coughs> Is it bold? I like bold stuff. I'm not subtle at all. I just, I'm in your face. In your face. Uh, even if it's not bold, is it interesting? Does it grab you somehow? Do you get something out of it? That's what we call So, what does your artwork tell you about yourself? Well, it tells, tells me, this one says, I see you. I spend my life, you know, I'm on the ferry and I'm off in the corner. Oh, I've seen something. I'm taking a picture of all this odd stuff that nobody else knows. I'm, I'm a seer, I'm a seeker, I'm a learner. I cannot get enough. I was a teacher for many, many years. I cannot get enough of learning. I keep learning to learn more and get better. So that, it tells me that. Um, I'm searching for an expression that captures the moment I'm in. So it could be an emotion, it could be a thought, it could be a concept. So I'm searching for that expression that just does it for me. And I'm a lover of nature and a lover of people. I had an opening last week and I said, I'm a lover, not a warrior. I make love, not war. And, and that's how I feel about my artwork too. I love doing I love nature and I love people. And so in the restaurant the other day, instead of eating my lunch, I'm looking at this gorgeous girl with the red hair and the white face. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'd love to do it. You know, something with that woman, but she's so busy. Nature, the nature in the north, and since I've been here this week, 
Oh, you live in a paradise. <laughs> and half of me wants to live up there, and the other half getting has more than half that's it. wants to live down here. We live in the seven years, so it's like coming home. So what are my future my, my future plans are just to get better and do more and keep doing it and teach it to my grandchildren and <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So and I want to say thank you to uh, Emma and Victoria for keeping in touch with us. They're amazing. They always answer our emails and tell us what's going on. And for teaching us. So if any of you think you can become an artist, just go along and see them. It's wonderful to be in Chinatown and the obvious in Chinatown as well. So, thank you very much. I uh, specialize in a kind of psychotherapy called body focused psychotherapy. So, the aim is always uh, for me when I'm working with people to help them have a sense of themselves and to be in touch with their sensory awareness. So, um, I come from that background in terms of therapy, and I think that you can see from all this amazing artwork that these folks have really explored a lot of their own sensory awareness. They're seeing their uh, ability to, to look at themselves and to, to be grounded in, in who they are. So it's a self-discovery process that I think they kind of run parallel together. Um, <coughs> Uh, one of the basic things in therapy is to create safety and um, so that people can go on their journey and, and look at themselves and peel away the adaptive layers and get to their more authentic sense of themselves. And that sense of safety, I think, is also what we have at Ground Zero, which is that sense of it's okay to be you. It's okay to express yourself the way you do. It's okay to have your feelings. It's okay to make mistakes. It's really one of the things that, that uh, draws me back to going down to, going up all those stairs <laughs> to get up to that studio to uh, hang out with this great bunch of artists and to um, work together. There's one mistake you're not allowed to make when you're there and that's getting ink on the blanket. <laughs> so, uh, which I have done and I survived and you know, to tell us to tell the stories. Uh, so a lot of people have talked about, or six people before me have talked about their, their journey and, and how they got to this place of, of, of creative work. Um, and uh, Victoria mentioned the whole idea of selfishness and I think we've come a long way from that idea of the self-critic and the doubting oneself and the being selfish to look at oneself to the place where we can have self-awareness and care about ourselves. And I think that that's, the, for me, the main aim in therapy is to learn to care about yourself, to learn to like yourself, and um, to develop that observing ego. The, the big buzzword these days is, is mindfulness. And to have mindfulness means to be able to step back a little bit and look at yourself. And of course, once you've created these things, you get to step back and you get to say, wow, look at that part of me. Look at this weirdo here. But she's called herself weirdo. You know, that's a little part of herself that she that she's willing to, to show us. Um, the other thing in therapy is the whole attachment issues and the mirroring of oneself, as the, the need to be met and the need to be seen. Um, so when you're doing a self-portrait, of course, it, it, particularly if you're doing it with your face, you're going to be looking in the mirror and you're going to be developing that inner ability to see yourself with your own mind's eye, which I think is an amazing skill to, to develop. So I, I think of it in terms of use of developing new eyes, new eyes to see yourself, new ways, new belief systems to have about who you really are and, and, and your own creativity and your own ability to express yourself and to move around in the world. I was thrilled when I read that David Hockney, who does quite a few self-portraits, he, he never wants to look good and he purposely doesn't make them look good. He says they are awkward material truths. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I went, oh, phew, thank goodness for that. Rembrandt, back in 1636, did a lot of etchings and self-portraits. And he did a beautiful one where he, it was, he's sitting at a table writing and sketching with his wife in the background. And they're just having a nice little chat. And he really wanted uh, to get across the point, I think, that art is part of life and life is part of art and that they, they come together in that way. And it's a beautiful um, print that, that expresses that. Um, so we, we're, I, I do a lot of work with grounding and centering and being in your body, but there's also the whole idea of, and, and uh, Cindy isn't here today, but Cindy taught us uh, how to do um, prints using our skin. And of course your skin is your boundary, it, it's your what defines you, it's you and other. Um, so we did these amazing uh, dry points, I've got mine over here which is my fist. Um, uh, where we put, put, ink, put ink on our bodies and um, went through the process of making a, an etching and, and, and printing it. And so I think that, that that's another way of just seeing the, how art and, and therapy can um, support each other and having boundaries and having a sense of yourself and, and um, uh, being true to yourself. So this idea of having kind eyes, of being curious, of being loving towards yourself uh, is my main message for you today. Um, when I was in Paris in 05, I think, I saw an amazing show by Louise um, Bourgeon, who did those huge spiders, you know, and the spiders were the symbol of mother, the, the weaver of, of protection. And of course, if you saw the show, you saw a lot of other father that was not so pretty and she did a lot of work to help herself through through her trauma but I remember reading that she said if I don't do art I go poo poo it's a French term but <laughs> um, so I think that we are all endeavoring to find our sanity and to, to get grounded and to be who we are and to, to grow and um, we have this great venue that we can uh, share with each other, and uh, I also want to thank um, Victoria, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.